We are delighted to be joined by pastor, professor and author, Dr. Ryan Putman. Welcome to Expositive Word, Ryan. Thank you, David. Glad to be with you guys. Pastor, professor and author. Wow, <laughs> you're a busy man. Yes, never a dull moment in my life. Sometimes you meet somebody and they really make you reflect upon how productive I've been with my life so far. <laughs> <laughs> you you must be about 100 years old, is that right? Yes, yes, it, it feels like that. <laughs> in fact, uh, it feels like I've, I've probably done that to my body at this point in time. <laughs> yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and how did you become a Christian? Yeah, well, um, I, uh, I was raised um, the, the son of a Baptist pastor, mm. um, so I was raised in a Christian home by people who always spoke the gospel into my life mm. and um it was it was relatively early on in my life that i had a very strong sense of my own sinfulness mm. and my own um need for jesus and uh i surrendered my life uh to the lord as a as a child and uh it, again it wasn't very long after that where i felt a real sense of god urging me and calling me into the ministry. Wow. Um, I developed a love for God's Word and the study of Christian doctrine mm. as, a, as a high school student, and it, it just stuck with me. And uh, that's kind of how I ended up where I'm at doing what I'm doing. I, I love teaching theology. I love reading theology, and I also love the local church and preaching in it. And I think that makes me a... Uh, a better professor because mm. I see my primary minister is, uh, ministry is training pastors yeah. to do ministry more effectively. So uh, it's good for me to have that experience yeah, uh, to yeah. bring to the to the classroom. Yeah, great stuff. So tell us about your new book and how did you come to write it? Sure. Uh, my uh, my first book was based on my dissertation and the question that I was trying to answer in my first book was why is it that we have this ongoing tension um, between this reformed principle of sola scriptura scripture mm. alone mm. scripture is the supreme source and only norming norm for Christian theology but yet we still have this ongoing development of doctrine in the history of the church you know mm. doctrines like uh the trinity in the fourth century debates or the the reformation developments of justification by faith or uh the more recent you know developments of the doctrine of inerrancy against modernism in the 19th century and uh and so my, the question i was asking then is if scripture is so sufficient mm. why then does it continue to develop and and why does doctrine continue to develop so i really sort of took that to the next logical step in my new writing project when doctrine divides the people of god um i really wanted to know is if if scripture is as the reformers called it clear hmm. if we affirm the perspicuity of scripture why then do we have um, the lingering problem of theological disagreement. Yeah, we also have this problem. I know it's true in America. I, I suspect it's it's true from what I've seen of Parliament yeah. um, in, o overseas. But you know, our our culture in the West is become so partisan mm -hmm. in its thinking, mm -hmm. and 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 the the development of social media has has really just served as a catalyst yeah. for making our conversations so mean-spirited uh so so black and white but also just unkind and and the thing that that i think that should be happening is the church should be acting differently the church should be speaking to one another differently but that's not always the case mm. And so it, this sort of theoretical concern that I had about the, the clarity of Scripture and the divergent interpretations of Scripture really came together with this practical pastoral question about what should Christians do when they disagree with one another and how should they respond to one another in public? Mm -hmm. And so I set out to answer two questions, the first being the, the theoretical question, 
why is it that Christians who have the same convictions about the gospel, who have the same convictions about the authority and inspiration and infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture, mm. why do they come to such rigid disagreements, usually on secondary or, or, or tertiary matters, and then when recognizing that we have disagreements, what should we do about our disagreements? What are practical steps we can do either to resolve our disagreements or ways in which we can treat each other um, more agreeably in our disagreements? Yeah, sure. Unity in the Bible it isn't just some sort of fluffy pipe dream. You know, this is spoken about by Jesus, right? Tell us a little bit about that. Right. Yeah, I mean, in John 17, the the great high priestly prayer of Jesus um, before before his crucifixion. It's a mm. powerful passage because mm. Jesus prays, number one, for himself. He prays that he would be glorified with the Father, with the glory that he had before the foundation of the world. And it's, yeah. a, it's a high Christological uh, sort of uh, a statement that he makes there. Mm. And then he prays for the disciples um, who he knows will suffer uh, for their obedience to the gospel. But then he also prays ultimately for those who would believe in my name because of the disciples, yeah. namely every other Christian who's ever uh, lived. We, we come to faith because we have the teaching of the apostles preserved for us in Scripture. So Jesus is praying in a very real sense for us yeah. prior to his death. And of course, what he's praying for is he's praying for unity. He's praying that we may be one as he and the Father are one. I mean, we we get an opportunity really to, to display in the church the same kind of unity that's within the Godhead, or at least that is, that is what Jesus um, hopes for and prays for us. Um, the problem I think a lot of people have, on the one hand, with different approaches to this is that they either they either feel like they have to sacrifice truth mm. or they have to sacrifice unity mm. Mm. and you know the 20th century ecumenical movements um in in protestant uh and protestant christianity particularly in mainline protestant christianity uh, and then some of the ecumenical movements that sort of followed Vatican II to try to bring dialogue between Roman Catholics and Protestants, mm. oftentimes those were all built on, on some form of capitulation or assimilation, meaning we, 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 we give up our theological distinctives, we give up truth, we yeah. minimize doctrine, so that we can have this sort of pragmatic unity. And we've seen in different situations where where that just leads to an outright dismissal yeah. of Christian orthodoxy. Yeah. And uh, I certainly have no place in my mind for that. Mm. Um, but I also am frustrated with, you know, this sort of, you know, arrogance that we sometimes see with Christians who do have a strong and clear vision for the importance of, of biblical truth, not being able really to relate to anybody else that doesn't see the Bible in every detail exactly as they do. Yeah, yeah. But when we see Jesus's, you know, prayer in John 17, he prays that we would be unified by the truth. Yeah. So we can't really have true unity as Jesus envisions it without truth yeah. and uh and so striking that balance talking about disagreement talking about unity but also maintaining the importance of doctrine those were both important to me yeah yeah absolutely like you just said we've got these two extremes haven't we we have the camps that are ecumenical in nature and often happy to partner with anyone including false teachers and we even see partnering with prosperity gospel teachers and and right. they just don't talk about the elephant in the room and then the other extreme, you have those that want to debate and divide over every theological nuance and refuse to even call somebody a brother and, brother or sister unless they can agree on every single right. detail, right? Right, right. And Protestants have a long history of that. I mean, you know, this is one of the things that Roman Catholic apologists will 
frequently call us to the mat for mm. uh, because we have so many uh, disagreements, because there's so many different traditions. Mm. Um, they, they sometimes will use that as a, as a, you know, a, a, a gotcha kind of thing. Yeah, Look, yeah. The, the Protestants aren't true Christians. Yeah. And of course, all this in some ways, uh, can be, can be blamed on someone like Martin Luther, who had a strong conviction that the Bible should be in the hands of every single Christian. It's not just the church yeah. that we go to, to get our, our theological opinions or our beliefs from. We go directly to the source, to the fount. Mm. Um, and, and, and being able to read the Bible for ourselves means we are going to have theological diversity. We are going to disagree about exactly what Scripture means. Yeah. You start the book off with a brilliant story involving Martin Luther. Tell us about that. Yeah, uh, the Marburg Colloquy of uh, October 1529 was between Luther and uh, Ulrich Zwingli. Um, they were called to this meeting by a German prince named Philip of Hesse, who what he really wanted to do was to create this sort of unified Protestant movement across Europe that could go toe to toe with the Holy Roman Empire, mm. and uh, you know, as you're well familiar uh, with this uh, this trend across Europe during the time was everybody had to to pay homage to the Pope. Mm. They had to listen to what the Pope said, and he had a tremendous amount of power. And uh, and 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 the rise of nationalism sort of started changing the the, the scene where. Where eventually, uh, where eventually, people who started becoming more uh, more focused on their national powers gave the gave the Pope less and less power. But but Philip of Hesse envisioned this this united Zwinglian and Lutheran uh, movement, and they happened to be sparring publicly in their printed and written materials yeah. about the Lord's Supper. Yeah. So he calls them together for this meeting, and they draft a document, the Marburg Articles, where they have 15 points uh, that they're, they're coming together to talk about. And out of those 15 points, they agree on 14 of them. Yeah. And uh, Lu Luther's a little suspicious later that <laughs> Zwingli might have fudged a little bit on some of the other yeah. ones. Yeah. But, but <laughs> out of 14, I mean, out of 15 points, they can agree on on 14, but they come down to this one on the Lord's Supper, and they disagree. Of course, Luther's view is what we call consubstantiation. It's this idea that, that Christ is present in the elements, physically present in the elements, um, through through his human nature that is that is ubiquitous that's everywhere in in uh, and then Zwingli takes you know the memorial view that mm -hmm. basically says that uh, that the Lord's Supper is done in memory of what Jesus did it's not that Jesus is actually present in the elements and it really was a hermeneutical debate it was a debate over the interpretation of Scripture. When Jesus says, "This is my body, take and eat," yeah. and uh, and 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 for Luther, he wanted to read that literally. Yeah. He wanted to, and he created this, you know, kind of complex Christology that enabled him to do that. Whereas Zwingli, um, Zwingli said, "No, this is a metaphor. We don't we don't take the idea that Jesus is a door literally, or that Jesus is a vine literally." Yeah. Um, it, it, it is a metaphor, and, uh, and, and so this really sort of marks one of the significant, you know, kind of turning points in, in the early, early Protestant Reformation because it prevented a larger movement from taking shape, but it also showed that the Protestant movement would continue to splinter on mm -hmm. um, so long as people went directly to the Bible and they didn't have a magisterium or a church teaching office to appeal to. Yeah. Yeah, wow. We're so blessed to live in the generation of God's redemptive plan that we do now, and we've we've got the help of the Holy Spirit to help us. How do Christ followers with similar convictions about Scripture and the Gospel come to such drastically different points of view in matters of faith and practice? 
Yeah, I, well, what I did is I sketched out uh, uh, several different options that are all related in some ways to mm. hermeneutics. Mm. And um, when I when I speak of her- hermeneutics in a general sense, I, I'm not even talking about biblical exegesis as much as I'm talking about kind of the philosophy of, of, of human interpretation. Yeah. And, and what, I, what I start by saying is we're all imperfect interpreters of Scripture. Mm. And I mean that we are imperfect in the sense that we are finite. We are, we are uh, created uh, human beings. We're creatures with limited minds. We can't grasp the things of God fully. We have built-in limitations that uh, are, are maybe part of our creatureliness, or maybe part of the fall. I, I don't know, mm-hmm. but but things like we 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 don't always understand what we read. Our our brains don't always process information correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, we we have we have memory issues. Um, we're also you know very much shaped by the time and place in history. That God and His providence places us, and again, I think that's consistent with what Paul says in Acts 17. Yeah. We 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 don't choose the world into which we're we're born, and we don't and choose the initial influences that shape who we yeah. are. Yeah. And then I think there's this other reality is in that that it comes with the fall. There's the noetic effects of sin, the effects of sin on the mind, which um, can distort the way we read the Bible. Unfortunately. And, um, and, and I think the work of the Holy Spirit certainly helps us combat the, the distorting effects of sin on the mind, but it, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that we will never have these effects on our mind yeah. at any point in time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that's the big picture thing. I, I, I sort of narrow in the focus and talk about different ways that we we will arrive at theological conclusions by by exegetical means, by the way we do word studies, by the way we do uh, grammar studies, by the way we do background studies, uh, literary context studies. I mean, there's there's a, a number of different hermeneutical and exegetical things that uh, that, that drive some of our differences. Yeah, a big part. Of I think the way that we come to different systematic theologies is is the way we reason differently, mm. and I use an analogy from Sherlock Holmes um, in uh, in 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 the beginning of my chapter on reason. You know, Sherlock Holmes was famous for for calling his method of investigation simple deductions. Yeah, um, yeah, but that's not normally the way that 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 philosophers talk about deductive reasoning deductive reasoning you know sort of starts with a with a general principle and moves towards a specific application but you know Sherlock Holmes would walk into a room and and sort of just look at just all the little details in the room and formulate a hypothesis about what happened and of course in in the the wor- world of, of of Doyle, I mean, he he was faultless yeah. in in the way that he would formulate these hypotheses. But we come to the Bible, and what we're trying to do is formulate hypotheses about how it all relates. God, again, in His sovereignty, did not choose to inspire a systematic theology yeah. textbook. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, he gave us he gave us a, a collection of, of writings from ancient Israel and from the early church, which are directed at specific situations that the people of God faced in those in in those times and places. Yeah. And, and and so, like when we read Paul's letters, for instance, we're not reading systematic theology. We're 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 being nosy and we're listening in to the the conversation that he's having with churches there yeah yeah and uh and try really to do kind of guesswork a lot of times as to what paul thought about different things yeah and one example that i like to go to is is first corinthians 14 when he's talking about this disorderly worship with the disorderly use of tongues yeah and uh you know we we disagree oftentimes about about the 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 
the continuation of the gifts, uh, these miraculous gifts, or exactly what these 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 gifts were. Because Paul never comes out and says, here is the gift of tongues. Let me explain it for you. He's writing to a church that presumes the meaning that he presumes or or has a shared understanding. So what he's doing is not defining the gift of tongues. He's addressing the problem with the gift of tongues as it was exercised at the church in Corinth. Mm. And so we're, you know, playing Sherlock Holmes. We're trying to guess based on the evidence that we see before us, uh, what what exactly was going on in Corinth. Yeah. And that happens with a lot of our doctrines. And then beyond reason, I talk about differences that we have in our feeling. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I say that intuition plays a role larger than we sometimes like to admit when we're talking about theological differences. Like some people I know... Uh, are are delighted by reform doctrine while others are repulsed by it. Yeah. And I think I think there's these sort of different emotional gut reactions that sometimes play uh, a part in our theological differences. I'm very careful to say I don't think theology should be driven necessarily by our feelings. Mm. It's it's not it's not a normative thing. We should try to submit all of our feelings and emotions under the authority of scripture and the lordship of Jesus um, that's exercised through the, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But, but that doesn't mean that we don't have those feelings, that those feelings don't sometimes drive us. I was gonna say and lastly the the, the, the last thing I, I, I talk about is is the the role that tradition plays in shaping us and Mm -hmm. and oftentimes we we read the bible or we exegete the bible for confirmation bias rather than trying to discover what it actually means like i I want to confirm my baptist assumptions or i want to confirm my presbyterian theology or or so on and so forth as i read through the bible rather than than you know, giving the Bible itself a fair shake. Yeah. So I think those are the major things. I'm sure there are other things that I could have listed, but those are the major things that come to my mind as to why otherwise like-minded Christians will disagree so much about, again, usually secondary and, and third-tier issues. Yeah, so good. We're 20 minutes in, and I can imagine that Many people that have already heard this interview so far have already gone to Amazon and ordered this book. You've sold it. You've done a great job of selling it. It's so good. Good, 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 yeah. good, good. When My sh- children need to eat. Yeah. <laughs> when should doctrine divide us and what are the hills to die on? Yeah, that's a great question. And my friend Gavin Ortland has recently published a book on yeah. that very yeah. uh, same subject. Um I've always been an advocate of, uh, well, at least I, I have been since my first day of seminary, probably, uh, of some sort of some sort of doctrinal taxonomy or dogmatic rank. They go by a couple of different names. The most popular one here in the states is is Dr. Moeller's theological triage. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I actually interviewed Dr. Moeller for the book and and got you know his his story on why he uses that particular terminology. His wow. mother yeah. uh, was a, was an emergency room triage nurse. And of course, when you go into an emergency room, um, at least here in the States, I, I can't speak to your experience, mm-hmm. David, but mm-hmm. it, but in the States, we, we, we will be sorted according to our importance. And, uh, and, and uh, if, if, if you're having a heart attack or you have a gunshot wound, you're going to be rushed to see a doctor. Yeah. But if you come into the emergency room with sniffles. Yeah. <laughs> um, expect to wait about eight or nine hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> and you can see a doctor. And yeah. uh, and 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 so that, in a lot of ways, sort of sums up what a doctrinal taxonomy is supposed to do. We sort things by their urgency or their priority, and and things that are most important. Um, you know, things that we believe are essential to. Christian belief are the things that we will die on, the hills on which we will die, the things that are that are worth really seriously fighting about. The reason why we have Christian apologetics mm. is to defend those first-tier issues like the existence of God, 
the deity of the Lord Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, so on and so forth. Mm. The second tier issues are those things that that sort of divide us into local congregations or denominations. You know, that they're they're not things that we see as 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 Christian making, yeah. but they are certainly things that 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 we can't in good conviction um, stay in the same uh, local church and disagree about things like baptism uh, or can be the Lord's Supper, church government, usually things that are tied up in ecclesiology. Mm. Mm. And then, you know, third and, and, and fourth tier things can be, can be important things, but not things that we necessarily make or break fellowship on. Like in my church, you know, I, 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 I acknowledge that there are probably numerous views on, on, on the timetable for the Lord's return and the yeah. meaning of the millennium. Yeah. The church where I pastor was, was very famously a, a, a dispensational uh, theology hub in the 1980s mm-hmm. and has had two or three amillennial pastors since. So we're a really confused bunch. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so the, the, the differences between us are not worthy of, 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 of breaking fellowship, but they, they do, you know, result in some interesting conversations. And um, I, I think the, the, what I wanted to do was, was talk about three ways, and they weren't entirely original to me. In fact, I, I think I, I, I got them all from, from other theologians. Three ways that, that we sort of sort people into different categories. Mm. Um, one of them is, is what I would call a gospel test. Mm. What is essential to the gospel? And we have this tendency in evangelicalism to sometimes call every issue that's important to us a gospel issue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I, and I, I warn people against that. I, I say that a lot of doctrines or teachings or practices can either support the gospel like I think the doctrine of biblical inerrancy clearly supports the gospel. Mm-hmm. I think a number of our practices are clear applications or implications of the gospel. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that they are the gospel themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and some of the ways we disagree about how the how Jesus' saving wor- uh, work is carried out or or the meaning of election, those things are not the gospel. There are things that support the gospel, so to speak. So I want to distinguish that which is essential to the gospel and those things which are supporting the gospel or are implications or applications of the gospel. Yeah. The other thing mm. I want to say is, you know, while I, I believe that Scripture is clear in that, in the sense that Martin Luther affirmed that, that, that Scripture is intelligible, God's not purposefully trying to confuse people who read it. Yeah, yeah. it we can interpret the scriptures meaning as the Westminster divines say not all scripture is a light plane mm. and and there are there are things in scripture which are very clear and there are things in scripture were, which are not as clear like again the example I gave of first Corinthians 14 or Revelation 20 when talking about the millennium uh, and, and some of the reasons they're not clear is because we're not the original recipients. Yeah, yeah. We, we're not. We don't. We don't have all of the background knowledge that original recipients would have had. And 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 typically the first tier issues are things which are clearer in Scripture. And the further you get from clarity uh, or or things that are that are readily apparent to readers the more disagreement we're going to have. So when, when Paul talks about baptism for the dead in 1 Corinthians 15, yeah. I mean, no one knows what that means. <laughs> yeah. Anthony Thistleton yeah. in his commentary on 1 Corinthians gives like 16 different <laughs> yeah. possible interpretations of that. Yeah. You're not going to split a fellowship over the meaning of baptism from the dead in 1 Corinthians 15, or yeah. if you do, you, you've got bigger <laughs> problems. Um, so, 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 and then finally, the practice test, like things that we, again, have convictions about with regards to practice. I might, I might not be able to, to have fellowship with, you know, in a local church setting, a local ministry, 
with with someone who has a very different view on baptism for me, mm. but that doesn't mean that we can't cooperate together in gospel ministry and evangelism efforts, yeah. and 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 other you know uh, and other you know sort of projects together. Um, I don't think that results in cheap um, ecumenicism. I think what it does is it is it, it's a way of saying, hey, I recognize this person as my brother or sister in Christ, but you know, because of my convictions about what scripture says, we, we can't do ministry in a local setting, but we can, we can't earn a church setting, but we can do ministry outside of the local church together. Yeah. Okay. When we seek unity, how do we avoid letting the wolves in with the sheep? And how do you practically manage that process as a pastor? Yeah. Well, um, for one thing, when, whenever, whenever uh, someone is 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 given permission to teach, it, it comes with a great deal of scrutiny. I think the teaching office, or 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 you know, the the use of teachers in the church, and we mm. give we gave laymen a lot of opportunities to teach, mm. laypersons a lot of opportunities to teach. They go through a through a through a screening process of sorts. They have to go through um, a, a sort of discipleship curriculum uh as 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 new members of the church they have to evidence over a period of time um the fruit of the spirit Mm. and and i like to see them engage with me and engage with other pastors in our church on on biblical and theological issues and that's just something that takes time you don't you don't earn the 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 right uh to teach instantaneously in the local church i think there's, of course, good biblical instruction telling us uh, not to let people teach too quickly. So that's a that's a driving factor mm-hmm. in 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 what I do. And again, I will introduce into sermons um, criticisms of 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 certain things that I I believe would be the heresies people in our community would be most likely to believe. Mm-hmm. So. A lot of my church members live in a neighborhood that uh, where 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 Jesse Duplantis lives, and Jesse yeah. Duplantis in America is one yeah. of the most well-known prosperity gospel preachers. He lives in the largest house in the state of Louisiana, yeah. <laughs> and his 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 church, um, if you would call it that is in that neighborhood and yeah. uh you know he's got the big televangelism issue. i don't have any difficulty calling him out by name yeah. or calling out that heresy by name from the pulpit and and to and to and to make my position known where i think these things are clear violations of, of first tier sort of issues yeah and and I, I i we offer courses in our in our in our you know we have a discipleship curriculum at the church we offer courses on on the cults and and various uh, other heresies uh, that, that spring up in the name of Christianity. So we try to offer several different practical uh, avenues to let people know in advance. Hey, this is where we stand on these matters. But we also want to screen uh, people at the local church level to make sure that that people who who endorse such teachings um, would not be given a a place or position to have authority over other believers yeah so good really really helpful i don't know if it's because it's more visible to everyone now that so many people are on social media but a lot of the fighting that we we see often happens on twitter is there a way for christians to to be able to interact with one another and discuss you know differences well is social media a a, a place where we can do that yeah you know i I blame a lot of things on social media in, in, in no small part because what social media does is social media gives everyone a platform for mm. better or for worse. Yeah. So everyone that has an opinion has a, has a platform to share it. Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 you know, I, that's not always necessarily a good thing um but but it is what it is uh we're 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 in that time um but it it is interesting that you know when i looked at the disputes that i covered in the book like the dispute between um luther and Spangley, um between um between whitfield and wesley it was really this sort of new technology 
of of the movable type printing press in the in the time of Luther mm. that really gave him the public voice that he had. He was using the technology of his day to gain the sort of traction that he had and and the technology did result in a lot of back and forth pamphlets. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At least with pamphlets <laughs> You know that there there's some time for them to think through what they're going to say instead of you know I've I've had my coffee this morning let me go ahead and and, and spout out my theological opinions yeah <laughs> um, yeah so th- there's a there's a key difference between between the two but yes it it it, it can be a wonderful thing I mean it, it makes connections between people like you and me mm. Um, mm. but. It, it can also be it can also be a thing where we engage in, in kind of trench warfare yeah where we forget that the person on the other side of the conversation is in fact a person yeah we attack an idea without thinking about necessarily the person to which these ideas are attacked mm. and and it can be dehumanizing in that way yeah. And you, you also wonder what kind of witness it is for anybody looking in as well, right? Absolutely. And that, that's that's my number one, really my number one concern mm. is the, 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 the effects that, that, that a lot of our theological discussions have on public witness. And in my final chapter, I, I talk about that because I talk about Wesley in Whitfield who, um, you know, start off as, as great friends um, at, at Cambridge and, and they have, they have, um, a, a great deal of influence founding the Methodist movement. There's the, mm. there's the Armenian Methodist movement, uh, often associated with Wesley, but there's also the Welsh or Calvinistic, uh, Methodist group that's founded by, by Whitfield. Mm. And, um, they, they start off as friends, but then again, they get into this tendency of public disputes to the point where a lot of the high church Anglicans who are critics of the evangelical movement use their dispute as a way of saying, look, 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 this is false religion all along because they can't even agree with each other. The same sort of thing that happens with Roman Catholic apologists. Yeah. Look, look at this yeah. false religion. Yeah. They can't get along with one another. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately... Just you know, atheists and agnostics will use the same sort of measures as well. Yeah, absolutely. With social media, it's easier than ever to find people like ourselves, right? So we can really easily find people with the same theology as ours. And if we're not careful, we can end up becoming a little bit of an echo chamber. I've heard yes. you speak before uh, about about how important it is to to make ourselves a little bit less comfortable sometimes, to reach out to and and, and even read other authors. Um, tell us how we can do that without being led astray. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I encourage my students to read broadly from across the theological tradition, mm. and, and 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 not speaking specifically to social media. But I mean, I I, I think there's great value in in my students hearing the best arguments from from Presbyterian theologians, the best representatives of Arminian theology or the best representatives of Pentecostal theology. Mm. And I think that is a good and healthy thing to do. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a Baptist theologian, but my, my dissertation was about an Anglican and a Presbyterian theologian. Yeah. And, and so I, I, I tend to have a great appreciation for Christians in other traditions. Um, I think there's 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 certainly a time and a place to 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 learn from your own tradition. Maybe split it up uh, half from your own tradition and 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 the other half of the time reading from other traditions. I don't know what the mathematical formula yeah. for that would be, but <laughs> yeah. I, I would I would encourage Christians to read widely because our pursuit is not to confirm our own assumptions, but our pursuit is to know God's word as best as we can and to learn from other interpreters of scripture there is value to what kevin van hooser calls the pentecostal plurality Mm, mm. of of the christian tradition hearing those different voices and just to be really clear on that that's not talking about going into the the nearest christian bookshop and looking at the best sellers because if you do that you you know you're going to end up putting out a load of prosperity teachers no 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 no. Uh, 
again, I, I, and and call me call me a snob if you like, but you know, <laughs> reading old books. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, C. S. Lewis, you know, says for every new book you read, you should read at least one old book. And yeah. For Lewis, that was that was books over three hundred years old. So yeah. uh, I, I don't know <laughs> that I read one old book in that vein for every new book I read, but I try to mix old books in as well, as well as you know the the best sort of. Um, representative works of, of Christian theological and biblical scholarship available today. Yeah, yeah. So we're not recommending that you go out and buy Live Your Best Life now. <laughs> <laughs> not unless you plan to critically engage it. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, and again, there's a time and a place to, yeah. to read heretics and to respond to heretics. And yeah. to, but, but I mean, you, you have to be really sort of trained for that you know, before you jump into it. Yeah, absolutely. Have you ever changed your mind on any of your theological positions? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Uh, more often, uh, you know, things, again, that are third-tier sort of issues. Yeah. But, um, but uh, I, my, ecclesio- I mean, my, my ecclesiology has changed over the years. My eschatology has changed uh, quite a bit. Uh, yeah. Because, again, the, 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 the era that I lived in and the in the 80s and 90s in the in the American South everybody was a dispensationalist and uh, I I eventually got over it the first step to recovery was admitting that I had a problem um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> last question who has been the biggest influence in your life and ministry and also what's been your favorite book that you've read well wow. well I, I would say again probably the biggest influence in my life has been my dad who's been a, a faithful Southern Baptist pastor for for, for nearly half a century, yeah. Um, and uh, in, in terms of most influential uh, person that I've read, oh wow, that's a that's a hard question to answer. Um, in terms of contemporary theologians, uh, Kevin Van Hooser, Alistair McGrath, N.T. Wright, those have been my my biggies. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, of classical theology, probably. Uh, Augustine or Aquinas, um, yeah. maybe Calvin. I, it, yeah. it, it just it depends on the day of the week. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed Thank speaking you. to you. Brilliant stuff. If any of the listeners Thank want to get in touch with you, um, I know you're on social media. Do you, can you remember what your handle is? Yes, it's at Ryan Putman. That's R H Y N E P U T M A N. Excellent. We'll put that in the description below as well as the link for the book so people can buy that easily. Thanks again for your time. I wish you all the best with your book. Thank you, David.